On reviewing what I have covered with this section, I realised that a couple of times I have skipped over OAuth2 authentication. I chose to use simpler methods of getting access to use for API demonstrations. These simpler methods are not always practical for real world examples. So for this job of the week, I will be demonstrating how to work with OAuth2 using a Talon job. To demonstrate this, I shall be using Fitbit's implementation of OAuth2. In the next episode, I will then show how this job can be used while working with Fitbit REST APIs. Before I show the job, let's start with registering a Fitbit app. This is the first step when working with OAuth2. After sorting out your registration for Fitbit, go to https colon forward slash forward slash dev.fitbit.com forward slash apps. Here you can see my registered apps and the one I'll be using for this. To register a new one, click on the register an app tab. Here we can see the application name, description, application website URL, I'm just using http colon forward slash forward slash localhost, organization, organization website URL, terms of service URL, privacy policy URL, OAuth2 application type, set to personal, redirect URL, default access type, I just want read only. The redirect URL is the only important URL that needs setting in this example. I set it to http colon forward slash forward slash localhost. Click to say that you have read the terms of service, after having read them of course, and then you would click register. But since I already have one set up, I'll skip to showing that one. I've called mine data collector. I'll click here to edit the settings so that you can see what I've used. You can see my application name, description, the URL settings have all been set to http colon forward slash forward slash localhost. As I said, the important URL to be set for this is the redirect URL. If we come out of edit mode, we can see the values we can work with. The client ID, the client secret, here is the redirect URL, the OAuth2 authorization URI for use when generating an authorization URL, the OAuth2 access refresh token request URI used to request access and refresh tokens. One of the good things about Fitbit's implementation of OAuth2 is that they make it as easy as possible for you to test out. Take a look and have a play with the OAuth2 tutorial page, seen here. This page allows you to add your application's relevant data here and will generate you the required URLs that you will need. Note, I should have clicked the authorization code flow at the top, as that is what we are using. You can use this page to get an idea of what is happening. Here is the first URL that the job will generate. This will be used to manually authenticate your app with Fitbit. The rest of this page will take you through the steps after that. Make sure to select authorization code flow instead of leaving it as implicit grant flow. Fitbit also help by providing some good documentation on this process. If you go to dev.fitbit.com forward slash build forward slash reference forward slash web hyphen API forward slash developer hyphen guide forward slash authorization forward slash, it'll take you through the steps required and the steps that I will show in the job in a couple of minutes. A very useful document. One final little piece to show you is the Fitbit web API page for you to explore the functions of the API. You can see this at dev.fitbit.com forward slash build forward slash reference forward slash web hyphen API forward slash explore forward slash. Remember the trailing forward slash at the end. We can test out the functions before we go through the process of configuring OAuth2 authentication in our app here. Let's look at a simple example of how to browse the activity types. To do this, we click on try it out and then click the execute button. And it failed. Why? Because even though you do not need to officially set up an app to use this, you still need to authorize. Thankfully, there is an authorize button where you can do this in seconds, like this. Now if we hit execute again, you'll see the API work this time and shows us a JSON representation of all of the activity types. Now that we have seen all of this, remember to make use of this stuff when trying this out, we can now look at the job that I've created. 
As with the rest, this was built using Talent Open Studio ESB version 8. So to try this out, you'll need this version or later. As you can see, this is somewhat of a bigger job than I've shown before. Now you've seen the complete job, I'll resize my workspace to make it easier to show what is happening. The first part of this job is the read context variable section. This does what it says on the tin. I'm keeping the data in a text file, so the first component is a T file input delimited. This is configured to read the data. This is a semicolon separated file with two columns, key and value. The schema represents this. Here we can see an example of the file I'm using. I've called this fitbitcontext.csv. It has the following keys with some of the values present. Client secret with its value. Redirect URI with its value. Refresh token with a value yet to be set during the job. Scope with its scope values. Text file, the path to this file. Client ID with its value set. Access token with its value yet to be set by the job. Remember that the client secret and client ID were created when we set up the app with Fitbit. The T file input delimited sends its data to the T context load component. This is a useful component for loading context variables. The key column holds the context variable name and the value column holds its value. Here we can see the context variables created for this job. Let me just expand the box a little. Here we can see the path to the file holding the context variable keys and values. You will recall that this was also set in the file. The reason for this is that we are completely overwriting the file in this job. So all values that are used must be enabled to be reset. You will see all of the context variables here that you will see in the file. The next component is a tjava component. As it is labelled, this is used to set the authorization header for the REST service calls. This is done with this code. You can see how the client ID and client secret are encoded to base64. This follows a string of basic followed by a space. This is set to the global map. The first time we run this, or when there is no access or refresh token, the following run if trigger will fire. The logic for this is, if the access token is null or an empty string, and the refresh token is null or an empty string, this path will fire. This takes us down the path of authorizing our access manually for the first time. The first tjava after this run if is where a URL is constructed that we will paste into a browser. In the code here, we link the base URL and the response type to the client ID, the redirect URI, the scope, and set an expiration period. This is printed to the output window when the job runs so that we can copy it and use it. We then have a team message component. This is unusual in a talent job since we normally wouldn't have user interaction in the middle of a job. In this case, and only for the first time running this, we need to be able to supply the job a value during the run. I have left a lot of this component configured as standard, but I have changed the buttons option to be of type question so that we can paste a value back to the job. Once the T message box is fired and the value is returned, the following T Java will process the value and extract a code that is returned by the web authentication process that the user will have been through. This uses simple Java string manipulation. The value extracted is stored in the global map. Once this code is extracted, we go to the get tokens from return code subjob and start with the TREST client component. The URL for the TREST client is https colon forward slash forward slash api dot fitbit dot com forward slash oauth2 forward slash token. It is set to the post method and to accept type JSON. The query parameters are set using context variables, computed values, the code just extracted, and a hard-coded value of authorization code as this will be constant. If we look at the advanced settings, you can see that the convert response to DOM document has been unticked as we want JSON returned. 
You can also see the content type and authorization headers are set. The authorization header is set to the value computed in the very first tJava. If there is an error with the TREST client, it is a good idea to have that printed out to the console when developing. So I have set a tlog row on the error output. We then have the textract JSON fields component. This will be very simple JSON. You can see it by turning on the tlog row just before this component. The loop JSON path query is just set to a dollar character and the access token and refresh token are set below. You can see that the output schema is set to those columns. The final component of this subjob is a tjava row. Here I am setting the context variables, access token and refresh token, to the values extracted from the JSON. I am using context.setProperty to do this. The next part of this path in the job is the update context file subjob. For this we use a tcontext dump component which outputs the keys and values of our context variables to rows. Finally, I'm using a tfile output delimited component to update the file that we started with with updated values. At the end of the job, after which other path that is followed is complete, is the return context subjob. This uses a tcontext dump and sends the values to a tbuffer output. This is set to have two columns, key and value, which we can see in the schema here. This component allows you to send those columns outside of the job to a parent job, which is how this job will be used in the next episode. So this path is the path taken on the first run when no refresh token exists. But when a refresh token exists, the whole process of generating an access token can be carried out with no human intervention. I'll show this path here. If we go back to the first tjava, we see another run if trigger. Let's look at the logic for this. This trigger will fire if the refresh token context variable is not null and if it is also not an empty string. If this logic is met, the get new access token from refresh token subjob is triggered. The first component is a tres client. It is configured in a similar way to the tres client we looked at a few minutes ago, with a couple of differences. The URL is the same. This is https colon forward slash forward slash api dot fitbit dot com forward slash oauth2 forward slash token. The query parameters that are set are expires in to a hard coded period of time, grant type to refresh token, which is hard coded, and refresh token, which is provided by the refresh token context variable. The advanced settings are configured in the exact same way as the TREST client shown earlier. as can be seen here. The next component, a textract JSON fields, is configured in exactly the same way as the textract JSON fields component used in the first path I showed, shown here. As with the previous path, the next component is a tjava row. Again, this is essentially doing the same thing. It is setting the access token and refresh token context variables. Following the tjava row, we have a run if link. The logic to trigger this is based on seeing that more than zero rows are processed by the tjava row. If this is triggered, the path will write the updated refresh token and access token data to the context file, exactly the same way as before. The job will then output the results to the parent job using the tContext dump and tBuffer output as shown before. If the tREST client fails, we have a tlog row to output that failure to the output window. We then have another run if trigger to check to see that more than zero rows have passed through the tlog row. If this condition is met, we have a tjava which is used to wipe any values from the refresh token and access token context variables and to print the message to the output window. The job then triggers the tcontext dump mentioned before to update the context file, this time setting the values of the access token and refresh token to an empty string. This will cause the requirement for you to reauthorize your Fitbit application.
so you will go through path 1 again. Let's look at the potential paths this job can take. First, the context file is read. If it contains a refresh token, the job will look to generate a new access token. If it does not contain a refresh token or access token, the job will treat this as a brand new authorization and will aim to generate both an access token and a refresh token. Let's run this job to show both paths and how they function. First of all, we'll look at the fitbitcontext.csv file to see its initial state after the Fitbit app registration details are populated. We can see the client secret is set, the redirect URI is set, the refresh token is empty, the scope is set, the context file is set, the client ID is set, and the access token is empty. Now we've seen this, let's start the job. The first thing we see is a URL which we need to copy and paste into a browser and hit enter. When the page loads, we need to accept all of the scopes and click allow. This will result in being redirected to localhost with our generated code in the URL. We copy this, then paste the complete URL returned into the message pop-up, then click OK. We can see that the job has taken the path to generate an access token and a refresh token. We can see the entire path taken by following the red rows counted at each stage in green. If we take another look at the fitbitcontext.csv file, we can see that the values present at the beginning remain, but the access token and refresh token values are now present. Now, if we run it again with these values present in the file, the job will take a different path and update the refresh token and access token without requiring user intervention. Again, we can follow the path taken by looking at the rows processed in green. We can see that the path taken is the other path. If we take another look at the fitbitcontext.csv file, we can see that the refresh token and access token has changed. As I said earlier, this job will be made available for you to download along with an example fitbitcontext.csv file. You'll need to add your settings from the Fitbit app registration page onto this file. In the next episode, I will take you through a job to use this job while accessing Fitbit data. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Sorry.